to have here our international Greenpeace director, um, and he would also like to uh, speak to you and, and tell us um, maybe a little bit broader what this wonderful ship Rainbow Warrior 3 is going to be used for in future actions as well. Kumi. Sylvia, uh, friends, colleagues, dear brothers and sisters, thank you all so very, very much for coming out this morning for this historic occasion for us. Because right now, if we are brutally honest with ourselves, we are living in a moment of history that can be called a perfect storm. We have a financial crisis, we have a poverty crisis, we have a climate crisis, we have an energy crisis, and our political leaders are not acting with the courage that the situation calls for and to respond to a perfect storm one of the things you need is a perfect ship uh, in building this ship which belongs not just to greenpeace it belongs to the millions of people that have contribute uh, small amounts of money to build the ship to organizations like the uh, dutch postcode lottery that have contributed significant amounts. We want to say thank you very much because this ship, we have done two things with it. One is to try to make sure that we have features on the ship that will allow us to campaign in a diversity of areas and to be, allow us to campaign in the most dynamic way. But the second thing was we were basically trying to build a ship in a way that we could do the best we could to show how a ship, if you are committed, can be more environmentally friendly and these sails, uh, which is what allows us to actually reduce our carbon footprint quite considerably, I'm told. I know nothing about ships, by the way, I should confess, uh, is one of the highest sort of sails on a ship of this size. So here's the story to the CEO of the company that refused to come here, is simply this. If a non-profit organization like Greenpeace can go the extra mile to try to do things that are more um, environmentally friendly, more sustainable and so on, why won't a company that has significantly more resources than us not make the right steps in the right direction to actually avert catastrophic climate change? That's the question to ask. And the last thing, the other thing I would like to say is that, you know, whenever we talk about climate change, we talk sometimes in like jargon, you know, there's lots of, you know, you talk about the coal, coal industry wants to tell us that they've got a solution called carbon capture and storage, CCS, for example, and so on. These are all false solutions and, and quite often what happens is we talk about the real struggle we have with the climate in a way it makes it difficult for ordinary men and women to actually get involved. And I want to say here today very, very clearly to the CEO of this company, to the CEO of every oil, coal and gas company, our message is very simple to you. We are not against energy companies. We are against energy companies that are not willing to transition from the dirty, brown, killing uh, uh, pollution that they do to a clean, uh, clean, green, renewable energy future. That's the choice that they have. And what we need to say to all of them is this struggle is about securing our children and grandchildren's future. That is what the struggle is about. Every CEO of every company that is driving pollution have to look the children in their eyes and ask themselves, are we acting in the interest of our own children? So let me, our message to them is, and, and particularly to our governments, in conclusion, too many of our governments have allowed themselves to become too influenced by those that run the oil, coal, gas and nuclear industries around the world. If you ask yourself who was President George W. Bush, for example, it's no secret he was an agent of the oil industry that bought that election for him, locked stock and barrel, and history will record that he responded to those interests of those industries very, very faithfully in terms of the wars that he prosecuted and so on. So right, so right now, we have to be honest with ourselves. 
as Greenpeace, we are winning together with communities like the ones that we're working with here in Borkum and so on. We are winning very, very important, significant uh, struggles and battles. But we must be honest to say that we are not yet winning and saving the planet. We're still losing the planet, right? So what my final message is, all of us have to ask ourselves as, as individual human beings, are we doing enough at this moment of this delicate moment of, of change in history? So my appeal to you is, we need you to get more involved. We need you to, to, to get as actively as possible. And on a, to end on a positive note, I believe history and momentum is with us. Those that want to stick to the old way of doing things are actually very, very clearly know that they cannot continue, but they're trying to hang on to get the last bits of, of profit from the oil in the Arctic and so on. But I think that on a positive note, more and more young people are getting involved around the world. More and more uh, religious leaders are getting involved, interestingly. Uh, and maybe I, 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 I was thinking, I, I, I was trying to think, how can I end the speech on a, with a joke? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think with, so okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make the joke with the religious community. And uh, by the way, any of you are religious, don't worry. It's, it's... So, uh, so, so I end with this little bit story about the Pope in the Vatican, right? So the Italian office of Greenpeace invited me to come there a couple months ago when there was going to be a referendum against the uh, uh, nuclear phase out which the people voted for the nuclear phase out despite all the things that Berlusconi did to try to block that. And so so I was being interviewed in a s studio in Paris and uh, in Madrid and uh, sorry in Rome in Rome, in Rome, in Rome. <laughs> Just sounds like I've been in too many places. <laughs> that was the joke, by the way. <laughs> so I was in Rome and then uh, there was a studio audience and, and then I said, well, you know, given that the Pope is nearby, we, what we need to hear from the religious leaders of the world is they need to step up now and also become a voice to protect this planet, right? And that, in fact, uh, they have a very moral uh, argument because you pick up the Bible, you pick up the Quran, you pick up the Torah, you pick up any religious book, there are gems of wisdom about why we should protect and conserve the environment. So I was saying, wouldn't it be nice if the Pope came and said to the world, folks, do you think that God is so cruel? Because God knew that human beings would need energy. So do you think God, so you didn't think that God was so cruel? He said, ah, Human beings are going to need energy, so you know what I'm going to do? I'll take the coal, I'll put it deep in the ground, I'll take the oil, I'll put it deep in the ground and in the ocean, I'll take the gas, I'll put it deep in the ocean, and, and so on. So people have to kill themselves trying to get to it, and in the process, destroy a whole range of other beautiful things like our rivers, our mountains, our oceans, and so on, that God supposedly created. So clearly, we need to tell our politicians and our business leaders, for too many centuries, you've been looking in the wrong direction. Rather than looking down for oil and coal, you should be looking up to the sun and the wind, which God also gave us. And so let's try and get our leaders to transition to the clean energy future that we know is within our grasp. And we hope the Rainbow Warrior will contribute to that. And I thank all of you for whatever you've contributed to Greenpeace and appeal to you to stay more actively involved. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kumi.